Hello, everyone. I have the privilege today of speaking with Mauro Porcini, the Chief Design Officer of PepsiCo. Today, we are going to speak about his brand new book, The Human Side of Innovation. Super excited to chat with Mauro today and to get his perspectives on the human elements of innovation. Obviously, innovation is very near and dear to my heart, as is the, the human side of it. And so I have a a few questions for Mauro today, and they'll help to, to give you a, a flavor and insight into what's in his brand new book, The Human Side of Innovation. And so we'll go ahead and jump right in with the, the first question. So Mauro, why is there no innovation without risk? Well, first of all, thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to be here with you today. Why there is no innovation without risk? Because the moment you change the status quo. The moment you take anything, it could be a product, a brand, an experience, a service, anything, and you modify uh, its nature, you modify that thing to take you to another status, by definition, you don't know exactly uh, what is gonna happen. You cannot control all the variables. Even just the fact that by modifying uh, the solution, People will react to it in a variety of different ways. There is a wonderful um, um, author and philosopher from Italy that inspired me since I was a child. Um, his name is uh, Pirandello. And he wrote a book uh, that in Italian uh, was called Uno Nessuno Centomila. I don't remember exactly how they translated the title in English. It's available in many different languages. But uh, literally, it means one uh, nobody, 100,000. And he talks about how we uh, are one person, uh, but then eventually we are seen by the people surrounding us in so many different ways. And so we are 100,000 different people for all the people looking at us and interacting with us and seeing something different in us. And then he goes on saying, well, because of this, you know, if you're not yourself anymore and you are all those hundreds of thousands of interpretation, uh, you become nobody. Now, we don't need to think about this third iteration and this idea of nobody, but uh, that inspired me since I was very young, because this is true for us as people, but this is true also for anything we do as designers, innovators, entrepreneurs, brand leaders. We create something, but we have no idea how that something is going to be interpreted by the people out there, how they're going to use it. They could spin it in one direction, in the other direction. And so by definition, when we create something, we need to try to understand as much as possible the people in front of us, their needs, their wants, their dreams. And then we need to do a leap of faith. We need to do a proposal. Ernesto Gismondi, the founder of the lighting company Artemide, this iconic, you know, premium luxury lighting firm, used to say, I don't create solutions for people. I create proposals. And we'll see how they will go. Obviously, you know, I try to manage the risk of the proposal. I try to control all the variables. But we need to understand that if we are innovating and we're really innovating, we are need to be ready to take risk. And we need to manage the risk with all the tools that we can, with data, with research, with our knowledge. But at the end of the day, we need to be ready to take the risk. And we also need to be ready, therefore, to manage the risk. I used to work in 3M and uh, the famous, iconic CEO of 3M for many, many years, um, William McKnight, used to say that uh, once again, there is not innovation without risk. He was saying essentially the same thing. And therefore, we need to manage risk in the culture of the company. We need to be okay with missteps, with mistakes, with failures, or as I like to call them, with experiments. We need to be ready to uh, embed the idea of failure slash experiment in our financial algorithms. And we need to make sure that if somebody makes an experiment that doesn't go in the right direction, by the way, an experiment that by definition is all about testing an idea. So in any direction it goes, is probably the right direction. But you understand what I'm talking about. Uh, when somebody makes an experiment perceived eventually by people as a failure or a mistake, we don't crucify the person. We actually celebrate eventually the learning coming out of that uh, misstep 
and we need to put in place also an ecosystem of uh, processes and tools to extract as much learning out of that misstep and share the learning with the rest of the organization. Yeah, I think I think it's very important that that last point, especially that you just made around learning, is the the key thing that you're trying to achieve with any experiment, and you can learn uh, from success and failure. And you know, most of the time we we focus on trying to eliminate risk, but I, th I think you're right that it's key to not only manage it but manage the acceptance of the risk. Uh, so. So building upon that, uh, you, you say in the book that uh, with innovation, you should start from our personal lives, but we also frequently say in design thinking that you are not the customer. So so how do you reconcile these these two thoughts? I love this question. And nobody asked me this question yet. <laughs> uh, I love it for a reason. Uh, in the American culture of design, that is the culture of design that essentially to, to fame the idea of design thinking and celebrated the idea of design thinking, I think there is somehow a misunderstanding about what design thinking really is. Because we've been celebrating so much the processes, the tools, the ways of working, uh, that we think that is enough to bring in a consultant, do a workshop on design thinking, and all of a sudden now everybody knows the methodology, we can do design thinking, we can solve the problems of the world with that. We think that we can bring in a design leader in these organizations and somehow in introduce the idea of design thinking, and once again, we'll solve everything. And the reality is that design thinking is not just a tool. It's not just about the tool, eventually, if you want to identify design thinking as a methodology. It's not just about that. There is the design thinker behind that. <laughs> and so there is all these conversations about the fact that you need to somehow detach yourself from uh, the product, the brand, the experience. You need to focus everything on your end user, on your customer, or your consumer, on the people you serve. I like to call them people, human beings. And, and so a lot of people think that you need to remove the sensitivity of the designer, the poetry of the designer, the ability of the designer to understand those insights, to observe people, and translate that into poetry. Translate that into something that is unique, that is different. You know, you can observe a reality in a neutral way as much as you want. But at the end of the day, if you put 20 people observing the same reality in the same way, these 20 people will create solutions that are 20 times different on the base of their sensitivity. And this is great. We need to say that we need to preserve that. It's so important to understand that the touch of the designer, the interpretation of the designer, you know, uh, how the designer translates something that is objective, that is neutral, that is really about understanding the people you have in front of you, but then add color, nuances, poetry, as I called it earlier, to make it magic, to make it unique. And this is the reason why you cannot replace designers with artificial intelligence, at least until artificial intelligence will be able to replace human beings. But then, you know, replacing designers or innovators will be the last of the problems of humanity because artificial intelligence will think that you don't need humanity at all because we are totally inefficient in this planet and we are destroying, you know, our society and our planet. But before we get there, hopefully we will never get there, the sensitivity of the person, the human being, is something we want to say. And we need to stop talking about design thinking and innovation processes as processes that need to be just objective and neutral without realizing the importance of having human beings with their emotions and their interpretations in these processes. This is so clear when you are in a startup, when you are a star designer to design a chair or a piece of lighting. They make the difference as the entrepreneur make the difference in a startup. And then we work in corporations, we work at scale, and we forget the importance of the human being 
with a unique approach and sensitivity that, that can transform a cold data, an observation that is available to anybody out there, in magic. The magic that make your company grow. The magic that add shareholder value to your stock. The magic that set you apart from competition. Yeah, very, very great points. I think that too often people get lost in the idea of design thinking as a, as a process um, when it's more about a mindset. And like you said, the magic that, that comes from identifying that key human insight and then doing something interesting with it. Um, that really Sorry, I don't know if you're hearing my Siri on the background. Siri, stop. <laughs> Siri, stop. She's not listening to me. <laughs> okay. I don't know. From time to time, she starts and uh, goes like this. Anyway, here I am. <laughs> well, she she just wanted to add to the conversation. Yes. <laughs> and she and she wanted to know why incremental innovation is not enough. <laughs> Should we ask her? <laughs> I'll try later. Let's see what she says. Um, look. Obviously, it's necessary. It's very important. Incremental innovation is safer and is a stable way to keep your company going, to keep it up to speed, and to progress towards something bigger and better. So we need that. It's not enough because... We live in a world that is continuously disrupted by new things. In the world of business, that means that we have so many new companies, new brands, new products coming in, in their uh, business reality, competing with our products and brands. In our life, it means that there are so many things changing all the time and we live in total uncertainty. And therefore, the ability to change and to flex and eventually to disrupt is part of this new ecosystem we live in. Uh, and it's becoming many situations for you know, many people uh, uh, in many companies, even a condition for survival. You know, if you're a person, you lose your job or you're attacked by a virus or something happened major in your life, you need to be able to disrupt. And and and, and this is creating so much anxiety in the society and so much anxiety in companies as well. But let's go back to, you know, the context of business and companies. We live in a world where today anybody can come up with an idea, get easy access to funding through the proliferation of investment funds and, or platforms like kickstarter.com where you can crowdfund your idea. The cost of manufacturing is going down driven by globalization and new technologies. You can go straight to the people you serve, what I like to call people and other person called consumers, through the e-commerce platforms to sell them stuff and through social media to promote your ideas and products. In all these areas, the companies of the past were building their huge barriers to entry. Uh, middle of scale of production, distribution and communication, it was so difficult to go compete with a big brand, with a big company for the man and the woman on the street. Today they can. And so the big and the small are left with just one solution. They need to focus on the needs and wants of people and create something extraordinary for them. The way we are trying to do that at PepsiCo is to think of a future uh, where, you know, understand what is the future, understand uh, so the society of the future, understand the food and beverage category of the future, and understand what kind of role PepsiCo could play in, in the future. And then understand what kind of product portfolio we need to have to be ready to the future. So already that thinking is somehow disruptive or generates idea that are disruptive. Then you need to figure out how to use them. These kind of ideas inform our innovation strategy internal, developing things in-house. It informs our partnership and new venture strategy. It informs our acquisition strategy. So you need to find ways to be disruptive in a strategic way to be ready to a world that is shifting and changing at the speed of light. 
and the normal cycle of innovation based on incremental linear innovation don't work as well as they used to work because of the speed of change. It doesn't mean you need to develop everything from within. It means that you need to develop an innovation strategy that then can find different kinds of outputs. You can do everything by yourself. You can do it with partners out there, or you can eventually make acquisitions as well if you are a company that can afford it. And this is, by the way, interesting because in the startup kind of world we live in, the acquisition strategy is what many of the startups are looking for. So it's a healthy ecosystem where you have entrepreneurs eventually build up new things, new ideas, and you have corporations at a certain point arrive and work with them. So is is a very interesting new scenario. But both the big and the small need to understand how to combine incremental innovation with more disruptive innovation and thinking. Definitely, definitely. And that, that's a that's a very important point that without companies seeking to acquire startups, then fewer startups would it would exist because they wouldn't see that as an exit. Um, very cool. So uh, let's go back to something that you spoke about there just recently there, which is uh, what is the harm in calling people consumers? Look, I studied design in school. We would never call the people we design for consumers. It would be so weird. Uh, we're calling them eventually users. Most of the time, people, human beings. We were talking already back then, uh, 30 years ago, about human centricity, but not as an innovative thing. It was just the way we were doing things. Uh, and so... If you call people consumers, you're going to face, uh, you're going to focus on the idea of selling them stuff. Obviously, I mean, you look at them as entity buying your product and you want to make money on. By the way, on top of it, you're going to uh, categorize people and reduce people to the idea of consuming. But you know what? Me, Mauro, you, my wife, my daughter, my friends, we do so much more in life than just consuming. You know, we do so many more things. And I don't want companies and brands to look at me as a consuming being. I want to have companies and brands looking at me as a human being for who I am. If you call them users, at least you're going to focus on the use of the product you're offering them. And so you're going to try to satisfy the needs that they have and create products that are functionally relevant and desirable. But if you look at them as people, as human beings, you're going to go above and beyond. You're going to think about them holistically. You're going to think about them as people you care about, people you love. You know, the subtitle of the book is People in Love with People. And when you love somebody, it could be your kids, your wife, your husband, your significant other, your parents and your friends. What do you do? Well, you try to do more. You try to really make these people happy, to do magic, unexpected. You want to make sure that you are serving them at 360 degrees. And this is you know, the mindset and the culture you build in your company, if you stop calling them consumers or even users, and you start to call them for who they are, people, human beings. It changed completely. Words are powerful and, and a word can help you shaping the culture of an organization. Call them people and you will have armies of other people in love with people trying to create something extraordinary for them. Is the product, is the brand, is the service. You're not going to be happy just with something that is good enough because it's profitable and people are buying it. You're going to try always to create something that is extraordinary because you want, first of all, to make people happy. Now, this was a luxury in the past, eventually for companies. Today is a need and is a must because of the competitive landscape we live in with barriers to entry crumbling down under the winds of globalization, new technologies, and digital media. And therefore, the need of these companies of really creating something extraordinary in all the different dimensions, because if you have one or few areas of weakness that in the past you could protect you, your barriers to entry, today are exactly the entry point for your competitor to come and 
erode your market share, your mind share, your love share with your uh, with the people you serve. Well, I think I think those are all uh, very important points that you have to bring it away from the act of consumption and back to the the whole person if you really want to connect with uh, the people that you are looking to to serve and to bring value and meaning to. Uh, speaking of meaning, what does it Sorry, take? That is to... my dog that is crying. <laughs> usually stays on the desk with me, one of the two, and and now it's not, but he cannot come up by himself. Let me get it. <laughs> Leon, okay. Very cute. All right, let's ask, you say Leo? So, okay. tell me. All right, so so let's ask you both then. So what does it take to make a design meaningful? Every time we create a product um, or any solution in general, somehow we are touching the life of these people in a variety of different ways. And we can add um, convenience, safety, beauty, style, and a variety of other values to the life of these people. Or on the opposite direction, we can make the life of these people a nightmare. We can create complications to their lives. We can make it challenging and difficult. Therefore, when we create something we should always be driven by this idea of creating something that is relevant to them and relevant to the company. You know, I, I, and, and so I define this relevance through a series of principles of meaningful design that I talk about in the book. There are two foundational principles uh, that are one, the idea of creating something that is functional, that is emotional and is semiotic. So, it fulfills a specific functional need. It creates uh, engagement at an emotional level between you and the product and the brand. And then somehow it represents you as a semiotic value. It tells a story about you to the rest of the world. Uh, and then the other foundational principle is that the, the solution should be essentially, and I, I synthesize it in a way, innovative, new, unique, different uh, from anything out there. Then there are a series of other principles that somehow take you the level down and give you a, a direction on how to design these products. The product should be sustainable from a, an aesthetic standpoint, from a functional standpoint, from an eco, ecological standpoint, from a social standpoint, respectful of people, um, from a, an emotional standpoint, from a financial standpoint. So there are a series of um values and I call it sustainable meaning that you need to think about your portfolio of products and solutions in time. It needs to be it needs to add all these different layers of value over time. Uh, it's not just about fulfilling a solution a, a need in the short term, but you're really thinking about how the solution is sustainable over time and now you need to be ready to change over time to create something extraordinary for them. Then there are a series of other clarifying principles, uh, but I invite you to have a look at the book. It will be a longer story, but it all, you know, those principles are really about the sensitivity of the designer and some of the things we discussed earlier in this conversation uh, about the fact that design is not just about the cold solution to a problem, to a product, uh, but it's a story that is the sensitivity of, of uh, the, 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 the designer or the entrepreneur or anybody coming up with an idea and creating the solution behind that. Very good. I, that, that story is definitely challenging to create, I'm sure. And uh, I think it leads us well into our final question, which is why do we work so hard as human beings to get the right answers to the wrong questions? How can we do better? Well, Often, we uh, live our lives, personal lives, as well as um, our professional lives, answering to expectations that come from others. And so here you are, and they tell you, well, you need to do this and to do that. You need to you know, have certain steps in your life. 
And you're like, okay, this is what they're asking me to do. I comply. I go to high school, I go to university, I get married eventually, I do certain things that society expects me to do. You go to a job and they tell you, this is your job description, I hire you because of this. And then later on they tell you, well, this is your project, this is the brief. And what most of the people do is answering the brief, working within the boundaries of the job description, living within the boundaries of those expectations of society. There are some people though, and usually this is the mindset of the innovator, the challenge, the convention, the challenge, the question, the challenge, the brief, not for the sake of challenging, but just because they want to understand better. They want to understand if what they're asked to do is the right thing to do for them, but also for the people asking. The people being your boss, the company, or even society. Do we live in the right society? Should we challenge the conventions of this society? Is my job description great for my company? Or I could do more than that to really help the company in ways that the company doesn't even realize. Is the question in the brief the right one? Or actually, they should ask me something else. Because if I just answer that question, I'm going to generate a series of answers that are great, that are right. But the question is wrong. And therefore, by definition, also those right answers will be wrong, won't have value. As an example, is an example I make in the book as well. Imagine they ask you to design a bridge. And many people would be like, okay, they asked me to design a bridge, so I'm gonna design a bridge and I'm gonna design a bridge that is beautiful, that is functionally unbelievable. And, and I, I, I'm gonna generate you know, a series of bridges and there will be incredible designers and engineers that will generate beautiful and super functional bridges that we all admire and are very iconic. But the real innovator, and by the way, the philosopher, the child, uh, we'll ask why. Uh, here I am with another dog. Just a second. <laughs> She's Bella. He is Leone. The real innovator, as well as the philosopher and the child, they all ask why. It's typical of the a philosopher to ask why, and then again, why, and then again, why is a technique to arrive to the root cause, to the primary cause of everything. The children do the same for other reasons. And so when, when you start to ask why, you will figure out in the case of the bridge that, first of all, yes, you need to move from A to B. Why do I need a bridge? Of course, you need to move from one side of the river to the other side of the river. But then you ask again, why? Why do I need to move on the other side of the river? And they will tell you, well, because in the other side of the river, there is the hospital. And therefore, the people of this town, they need to take a bridge to arrive in a convenient way to the hospital. If you stop there, immediately you will think, well, maybe the bridge is the solution, but maybe I can invent something else. Maybe I'm going to invent a sort of drone that you can ride that can make each person real time, super quick, much faster than taking a car and going on a bridge, arriving to the other side of the river. So already that is an innovation. Instead of designing a bridge, you're designing a machine that can fly, it can take you to the hospital. But if you keep asking why, maybe you arrive to realize that actually you don't need the hospital on the other side. You know, the hospital is there, but you can build an hospital on this side of the river. And so instead of designing yet another bridge, you're going to design an hospital that is by far a better solution because these people can arrive much faster to the hospital when they need it than taking a bridge and going to the other side of the river. This is a very banal example, very simplistic example to show how often we keep creating solutions for problems that are not the right ones to solve. And if we will question the challenge, the brief, we we'll arrive to something very different. I did this all my life uh, because of a mentor that with his behaviors and the way he was conducting business somehow taught me that kind of mindset. He was my partner in the agency I created many years ago. His name is Claudio Cecchetto, a famous show business producer. Imagine like meeting Jay-Z here in the United States when you're 24 and creating a company with this person. So that's what happened to me. And I learned 
by observing him, how he will challenge everything. And every time thinking, how can I do something different from uh, what I did? You know, he even himself did before or from what everybody else did before. And he was using this technique of always trying to understand the root causes and how you could really create something relevant for people in a different way. And so with that kind of mindset, I joined 3M, I joined PepsiCo, and I started with challenging my own job description, creating something different uh, in the way I was interpreting my job. They were asking me to design products, mostly the aesthetic side of a product at 3M. I created the chief design officer position over time doing much more than what they were asking me. And I thought I'd be in so much more value for the company than if I was just designing the style of those two products they asked me to design when I was 27. Wow, lots of great insights today, Mauro. Thanks for sharing them with us, both here today on the, on the Zoom and then also in the book. Again, the title is The Human Side of Innovation. Thanks so much. Thank you for having me. It's been a pleasure.